So in Transformers Age of Extinction, there's this one scene where we see Harold Attinger, the founder of Cemetery Wind, throw these cards all over this table. Now some didn't really give a second thought about these cards and shortly forgot about them after this scene. But to us hardcore Bayverse fans, we knew that those cards meant everything, since they literally held the key to answering the question of what ended up happening to so many of our favorite childhood heroes and villains. For context, after the Battle of Chicago, public opinion on the Autobots fell to an all-time low, and many felt that the world would only truly be safe if all Cybertronians were gone. Many higher-ups in the government felt the same way, and one man made it his mission to bring the age of the Transformers to a close. That man was CIA agent Harold Attinger. In response to the devastation inflicted upon Chicago, Attinger founded Cemetery Wind, a faction of the CIA which seek to wipe out the Transformers in order to save mankind. In his opening scene, we see Attinger address the committee about Cemetery Wind's progress, with him saying that a handful of Autobots were given sanctuary after joint combat operations were abolished, and that fewer than a dozen Decepticons were still on the run thanks to Cemetery Wind's efforts. During this address, we saw him flip playing cards that had the faces of various Autobots and Decepticons on them. Now, though for the most part, these cards already confirmed information that we already Already knew, such as Ironhide being dead and Bumblebee still being alive, it also revealed to us some new information, such as a character by the name of Loader existing. Now, as a kid, I remember this scene vividly, and when watching the film, I hoped that they would have ended up showing more of these cards, since there was an entire deck of them. But unfortunately, they never did. And out of the eight Autobots that survived to the end of Dark of the Moon, Age of Extinction only gave closure to four of them, with Optimus Prime and Bumblebee surviving, while Ratchet and Leadfoot were taken out by Cemetery Wind. However, the film did give us a surprise, showing that Brains, who was assumed to be dead after he and Wheelie crashed the mother ship was in fact alive, with him being captured by the robotics company Kinetic Solutions Incorporated. As for the fate of his partner in crime was still a mystery. This left the fates of Roadbuster, Top Spin, Sideswipe, Dino, and Wheelie up in the air. But when the sequel to Age of Extinction, Transformers The Last Night came out, we would get closure for two more Autobots. In the film, we got to see Wheelie hanging out at Cade Yeager's junkyard, and Top Spin chilling out in Cuba with Seymour Simmons. And for the longest time, this was as far as we got when it came to figuring out what happened to all the Autobots, leading us fans to making countless theories about what happened to them, especially for Sideswipe. But everything would change on February 12, 2019, since Profiles in History announced that they were auctioning off various props, costumes, and set pieces from Dark of the Moon, Age of Extinction, and The Last Night. One of the props that they were selling was the Cemetery Wind kill cards, and when various images of them were posted, Fans went wild since after years of speculating, we finally got some closure for some more characters. In addition to getting to see some brand new cards that we haven't seen before. But before I dive into this revelation, I want to give a quick word to our sponsor, HelloFresh. Have you ever been so focused on work that you forget to make yourself a dinner for the night? Well, HelloFresh has your back. HelloFresh carefully selects seasonal ingredients at their peak ripeness, ensuring that they make their way from the farm to your doorstep within less than a week. When I got my package, all the food was neatly packed and surrounded by these three high-quality ice packs, which ensured that the food stayed cold even on the hottest of days. And between the creamy tomato soup with pork sauce, the down-home and steak potatoes, and the one-pan turkey stir-fry tacos, the down-home steak and potatoes was by far my favorite. And out of the three, it was the quickest to make, with a box to plate time of just 15 minutes. That's the beauty of HelloFresh. Their pre portioned ingredients allows you to spend less time meal planning and makes it easy to get to the stove and cook up a yummy meal right away. On their website, HelloFresh has 40 recipes to choose from weekly, so you can make meals that everyone at the table will enjoy. They even have vegan recipes too. So what are you guys waiting for? Go to HelloFresh.com and use code THEORYMIS16 at checkout for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Once again, that's HelloFresh.com and use code THEORYMIS16 at checkout for 16 free meals plus free shipping. And with that said, I want to thank HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. Now, thanks to this Profiles in History auction, we were able to learn that Dino, also known as Mirage, was alive in addition to Roadbuster as well. We also got to see a card for The Driller, Sentinel Prime, Starscream, Igor, and this long haul lookalike named GarageBot. But one of the most surprising things that we got to see because of this auction was a card for both Skids and Mudflap. 
And since both of their cards didn't have an X on them, this meant that the two of them were alive. Now, these were all the new cards that we were able to see. However, us fans knew that there were way more. Since in the images, we could see that several cards were either face down or stacked on top of each other, leading fans to wonder who could possibly be on the rest of the cards. Now, something that Profiles in History did was that they split up the cards into two separate auctions. According to them, there were a combined total of 13 decks. The first set auction off sold for $1,024 and consisted of six decks, four that came in their original box, and two loose decks. The second set on the other hand sold for $896, and consisted of seven decks, three that came in their original box, and four loose decks. Now something interesting here is that the auction states that some of the cards came in their original box. Now this is fascinating since the film itself never showed these cards coming out of any box, because we only got to see Antinger hold on to the cards. It appears that the box is this white thing at the bottom covered in plastic wrap and was likely used during production to carry the cards around. Now my best guess as to why the cards were split into two separate auctions was due to the back of the cards. In the first lot, we can see that the back of the cards have a black design with the Cemetery Wind logo, while the second has a brown design with the Cemetery Wind logo. And as we know, the cards with the black design would be the ones to make it into the film, which is likely the reason why the first lot sold for more despite it having less cards. Now something that is pretty cool with the majority of these cards cards is that the images that you see on them are all completely unique and were not taken from any of the films. For example, take this card for the driller. If you look at the background, we can see a brown mountain behind him, which is a location that he never appeared in. This background can be explained away since when the ILM animators would preview a CGI model on their computers, for some reason or another they chose an on-site location shot of the scene where the Autobots raid an illegal nuclear site in the Middle East to be the background. And since the driller's model is curved, part of the mountain got in the shot. Now the mountain would also make a cameo in some other cards, those being for Alita 1, Loader, Skids, Mudflap, Igor, and Ironhide. However, Ironhide's is by far the most egregious of the bunch. Since if you look all the way to the right, you can see the front bumper of Bumblebee's vehicle mode, and this error made it all the way into the final cut without anybody noticing it. Now, the rest of the characters for the most part wouldn't have this problem, with the majority of them having a blue background, which is highly likely to be the sky from this shot. However, there's a few outliers. Mirage's card for some reason just has a strange gradient background, which appears to be the same one from the special features. Now, the last two outliers would be Optimus Prime and Bumblebee. Prime's image for some reason is just a still shot from the scene where the bots are hiding from Shockwave, while Bumblebee's image on the other hand is just one of the promo renders Hasbro used for Dark of the Moon. And if you have a keen eye, you would know that Bumblebee sported his Revenge of the Fallen design in those renders and not his Dark of the Moon one. And for some reason, B's the only one that appears to have a unique background, with his having an image of some sort of warehouse. However, interestingly enough, he would have a variant that sported a blue sky background and used his Dark of the Moon design. To this day, I'm still confused why they didn't just use this card for this scene. Now, the last fun fact about these cards that I want to bring to light is that they are actually based off of the real-life most wanted Iraqi playing cards. You see, during the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the US Defense Intelligence Agency developed a set of playing cards to help troops identify the most wanted members of President Saddam Hussein's government, mostly high-ranking members of the Iraqi regional branch of the Arab Socialist Ba'ath's Party or members of the Revolutionary Command Council. Each card contained the wanted person's name and address, and if available, the job that they performed. The highest ranking cards, starting with the Aces and Kings, were used for the people at the top of the most wanted list. In the case of the Cemetery Wind Kill cards, Optimus and Megatron were the Aces, while Sentinel Prime was the King. These cards had the name of the Cybertronian, what faction they were a part of, and where they were last seen. The majority of the cards said last seen Chicago on it. However, Optimus Primes had last seen Mexico City on his, and Alita 1 appears to have last seen Egypt on hers, based on the YT right here. Now, there would only be two cards that would be inaccurate with their last seen text. The first one was Ironhide, since he was killed by Sentinel Prime right outside of Ness headquarters in Washington, D.C. And the second one was Igor's, since in the film he was last seen on screen with Megatron and Starscream at the Lincoln Memorial. However, his last seen Chicago text could still 
still technically be accurate, since it's likely he would have traveled with Megatron to Chicago. And interestingly enough, his car doesn't have him listed as deceased, meaning that he is still out there roaming around, just like the Dark of the Moon movie adaptation comic showed. Now, out of all the cards that we know of, there is one that's inaccurate, that being Leadfoot's card. It should have a red X over his, since he was killed off by Cemetery Wind in the film. The only in-universe explanation I can give to fix this mistake is that this deck of playing cards was created before Leadfoot's death, and Attinger had not gotten around to updating it. Now, with that said, when these cards were auctioned off, a lot of us fans thought that the owner or owners of the cards would share them online. But after the auction, days became weeks, weeks became months, and months became years. And as of the time of this recording, it's been over four years since the auction and no images of the prop cards have ever surfaced to my knowledge. And for some reason, this was a common trend for almost all of the props auctioned off. I've been able to find very few images of any of the props that were posted by the auction winners. Despite this setback, I still really wanted to get to the bottom of this kill card mystery. And so, a few months back, I reached out to Heritage Auctions, the website that hosted the auction, to see if I could get any info on the auction winners. Though they allowed me to write up an email that they would forward to the winners, I unfortunately got no word back. So, to try to get to the bottom of who could potentially be on the rest of the cards, let's take a look at all the cards that we have so far, and try to work from there. As we know, there are 13 decks, and out of those 13, we know two main variants. Six decks with a black back, and seven decks with a brown back. And within these two main variants, there are at least two sub-variants for each deck that we know of. Variant A has an X over the character that was killed, while Variant B has the text eliminated over the character that was killed. Now, something interesting is that Variant B, the cards with the eliminated text don't have the last seen text, while Variant A, the cards with the X on it do. So with this information in mind, let's now attempt to assemble a full deck of these cards. And luckily enough for us, the entire deck follows two distinct rules. Rule 1 is that each bot and con are tied to a certain number or letter, and rule 2 is that the Autobots have to be hearts and spades, while the Decepticons have to be diamonds and clubs. To illustrate these rules, take this card of Bumblebee. As you can see, it's the Jack of Spades. This will mean that the Heart of Spades will also be Bumblebee. But the Jack of Clubs and by extension, the Jack of Diamonds can't be Bumblebee, and instead it has to be a Decepticon, in this case Garage Bot. So with these rules and parameters in mind, let's get to it. Starting off with the aces for the bots, Optimus takes this spot thanks to the images from the prop auction and this scene from the film itself. Moving along to the twos, we unfortunately have no clue, since we have no images of a two of spades or a two of hearts. So we're going to have to leave that one blank for now. With that said, let's now jump over to the threes and the fours. As for who takes these spots, well, it would be the notorious Gids and Mudflap. Now, we know this thanks to the Associated Press's coverage of the prop auction. If you look closely at the Three of Spades, you can see Skids' right shoulder. And if you look closely at the Four of Spades, you can see Mudflap's right headlight. Now, something that is interesting here is that these two are sporting their Revenge of the Fallen designs. This is particularly fascinating since Skids and Mudflap were planned to star in Dark of the Moon, but were ultimately cut. Vehicle mode concept art was drawn up for them, which ultimately turned into their real-life prop vehicles. However, to this day, no concept art of what their robot mode designs would have potentially looked like has ever surfaced. But since these kill cards are using their Revenge of the Fallen designs, this implies that their Dark of the Moon robot mode designs never made it to the CGI modeling phase. With that said, let's now cruise over to 5 and 6. And here we have Roadbuster and Leadfoot respectively. And we know this thanks to the Associated Press. Now, taking a look at the sevens, because of the film, we know that this card belongs to Q, also known as Wheeljack. Now, something interesting about his card is that it seems like it has two variants. If you look at this shot, we can see this gray piece on the right side of Q's head, with it sitting up this high. However, in the shot where Attinger tosses the cards, we can see that this piece sits a bit lower. Now, I'm not too sure if this is indeed a second variant, so feel free to let me know what you guys think. Moving along to number 8, we have Dino, also known as Mirage. And we know Mirage is number 8 thanks to the prop auction. Now cruising on over to number 9, we know that this is the one and only Ironhide. 
Thanks to the film and the prop auction, we know that Ironhide has two variants. One where it's just his face, and another where more of his body is in frame. Now moving on to number 10, we have something that is very fascinating, and might just answer an age-old question we have been wondering since 2014. Though the film nor the prop auction ever showed us a ten of spades or hearts, the Associated Press's coverage on the prop auction in fact did, showing us a ten of spades. Now unfortunately, the card was covered for the most part. However, I was able to make out two very important details. One, the card didn't have an X on it, and two, the character was silver. As we know, there are only two silver Autobots in the Bayverse. However, since these cards don't appear to have anyone from the 2007 film, in addition to the fact that this character is alive, Jazz is out of the picture, meaning that the Ten of Spades has to belong to Sideswipe. Now, some more evidence to prove that this card belongs to Sideswipe is the design of the armor. If you look closely, and I know it's a little blurry, we can see this line going through it right here and another one on top of it, almost like the armor is overlapping. And well, if we compare this design to Sideswipe, we can see that the armor on his chest overlaps each other, meaning that it has to be him. Now, though we don't have a clear image of the card, based on the clues that we have, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that this card belongs to Sideswipe. And despite the Bayverse being over for some time now, I'm just glad knowing that Sideswipe is still alive out there. Now moving on to the Jax, thanks to the prop auction and the film itself, we know that this card is for the one and only Bumblebee. And just like Ironhide, he has two variants. One that uses his Dark of the Moon design, while the other uses his Revenge of the Fallen one. Now moving along to the Queens, thanks to the film we know that this card belongs to Alita 1. So naturally, we can put her for both of the Queen spots. Well, we actually can't. And the reason why is because, for some reason, the Queens don't follow Rule 1. Which was that each bot and con had to be tied to a certain number or letter. This is because on the Decepticon side, Starscream is the Queen of Clubs, while Igor is the Queen of Diamonds. I have no clue as to why the designers of these cards chose to do this, but since there is a rule break here, we can only put Alita 1 as the Queen of Hearts. And since we don't have any images of a Queen of Spades, we're going to have to leave that blank for now. Now, another thing I want to touch a base upon with Alita 1 is how we know it's actually her. The reason why I bring this up is because a lot of people have mistaken this card for RC. The reason why we know this card has Alita 1 on it and not RC is due to her purple color and tattoo. If we compare RC's and Alita's models side by side, you will notice that RC is a reddish pink, while Alita is purple. You will also notice that RC has a black tattoo, while Alita has a white one. So with this information in mind, when you look at the card, you can clearly see that it is Alita 1. With that said, let's move on to the last of the Autobot cards, that being the Kings. And thanks to the prop auction and the film, we know that Sentinel Prime is in fact both of them. With that said, let's finally now move on to the Decepticons. Starting off with the Aces, Megatron takes this spot, thanks to the images from the prop auction. Moving along to the twos, thanks to the film, we know that this spot belongs to Loader. Now, for those of you who might be scratching your heads right now saying, who the heck is a Loader? Allow me to explain. In Transformers Dark of the Moon, we saw Dylan Gold and his organization transport Sentinel Prime's pillars in this armored truck which had several Decepticon logos on it. We only ever saw the truck one last time when the pillars were being offloaded. For a while, fans didn't know if this truck was meant to be a Transformer, since we never saw it transform. However, we would get an answer thanks to the Facebook version of Ask Vector Prime, which was set up by the Transformers Collectors Club, when somebody asked, what is the name of the Superfund truck Decepticon who participated in the invasion of Chicago? Vector Prime responded with, I believe you are referring to Loader. However, something that is very interesting is that this response from Vector Prime happened on July 31st, 2015, which was over a year after Age of Extinction released, meaning that the card predated this response. So whether or not the loader that we see on this card is in fact to be the armored truck Decepticon is unclear. However, the biggest mystery of all is what image is on the card, since it looks completely different from anything we have seen before. And if it is meant to be the armored truck Decepticon, then this would mean that a CGI model was made for him but never used. Hopefully one day we will get a clear image of what is on that card since it's been something that has been eating away at me for years. With that said, let's now move on to the next card. 
And thanks to the prop auction, we know that number 3 belongs to Shockwave's pet worm, Driller. Moving on to the 4s, we unfortunately have no clue, since no images have ever surfaced for them. And the same case goes for 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. However, thanks to the film and the prop auction, we know that 10 belongs to the one and only Shockwave. Now moving along to the Jacks, thanks to the prop auction, we know that it's GarageBot. Now you might be wondering, wait, who the heck is GarageBot? And why does he have Long Haul's image? Well, it's been highly speculated that the name GarageBot was a typo, and whoever made the prop card almost certainly meant GarbageBot. Since in Dark of the Moon, there was a protoform that resembled Long Haul that scanned a waste management truck. What makes things more confusing is that the playing card features an image of Long Haul's Earth Mode, making some fans think that the Long Haul type Decepticon that is seen in the final battle of Dark of the Moon is GarageBot and not this garbage truck Decepticon. However, since the Long Haul type Decepticon was killed by Optimus, it could not be GarageBot since GarageBot's card does not list him as deceased, indicating that the dead Long Haul lookalike is an unrelated character, and that the garbage truck Decepticon is supposed to be GarageBot. As for why the makers of this card use the Long Haul model instead of the Long Haul Protoform model is still a mystery. It's also kind of strange that they made him the Jack, since you would think that card would be given to someone like Soundwave. However, my crackpot theory as to why is because of the Revenge of the Fallen video game. In the first level of the Autobot campaign, you start off as Bumblebee, but for the Decepticon campaign, you start out as Long Haul. Now, this explanation certainly holds zero weight, so feel free to let me know why you guys think GarageBot here is a jack. And yeah, there you have it. These are all the cards that we know of thanks to every piece of information that we have. As you can see, we know a lot more Autobots than Decepticons, which is good since the majority of the Autobot cast disappeared without a trace after Dark of the Moon, while we knew that the majority of the Decepticon cast was killed off. So with 11 spots left vacant, I now want to speculate on who could possibly be on the rest of the cards. Starting off with the Autobots, we have two spots left. If we take a look at the Dark of the Moon Autobot cast, there are four members that are currently not on a card, those members being Wheelie, Brains, Topspin, and Ratchet. As we know, Cemetery Wind was focusing on the larger Autobot threats, meaning that Brains and Wheelie would be less of a priority, especially since one of them was captured at KSI. So with that said, I would place Topspin as our number two, and Ratchet as our second queen. So now, let's move along to the Decepticons and flesh out their roster. For number four, I would place Laserbeak. And for five, six, and seven, I would put the Dreads, Crankcase, Crowbar, and Hatchet. For number 8, I would place everyone's favorite bad cop barricade in this spot. And for number 9, I would place the Decepticon communications officer here. Now, interestingly enough, a Soundwave kill card does exist. And we know this thanks to the film. If you look right here, we can see a card for Soundwave. And we know it's him since if we boost a saturation up, we can see this blue part surrounded by silver bits. And if you have a keen eye, you would know that this blue piece is one of the subwoofers on Soundwave's chest. Unfortunately, we don't know what number Soundwave is, but I would be surprised if he would be anything lower than a 9, hence why I'm placing him here. So with Mr. Wave squared off, let's now fill in our king. And since we need someone around the same threat level as Sentinel Prime, who better to put than the Fallen? Now you probably already noticed that there are two unfilled Joker cards left. Now, it's impossible to know if there were any Jokers in this deck, since no images of them have ever surfaced online. But if there were, it's safe to say that one was likely an Autobot and the other was a Decepticon. As for my prediction, I would say that Jolt would be our Autobot Joker and Sideways would be our Decepticon one. And with that said, that's all my predictions for the cards that we don't know about. If you agree or disagree with my predictions, feel free to let me know in the comments below. However, I really I really don't want to search for these cards to end with my predictions, since ever since I watched Age of Extinction in theaters for the first time, I always wanted to know who was on the rest of the cards. So to spark some interest in trying to answer a nearly decade old question, I'll be proposing a $500 bounty for the first person who is able to track down images of a full deck of these cards. If you know anything about these cards or any potential leads, email me at cwkillcards2023 at gmail.com. Hopefully one day we will be able to put this mystery to rest. Now, if you guys are still in the mood for some more mysteries, check out this video where I discuss if Transformers Rise of the Beast is a prequel or a reboot.